Good afternoon and welcome to our event on Globalising Ferguson. We're going to get started because we've got a lot to get through and um, only a short amount of time, so please. Um, I want to welcome you. My name is Julia Dem. I'm a residential fellow at the Institute of Global Law and Policy and I'm absolutely delighted that you could all come and attend this event and I'm so delighted to have all our guests here and to welcome them all um, to talk to us here today. I want to keep introductions to a minimum so that we can hand over to our guests and get started. Um, we'll structure this forum in two parts. My co-chair Deborah Popovsky from the Human Rights Clinic here at the Harvard Law School will be chairing the first half of the panel which will discuss the decisions to take um, questions of racialized policing so the UN um, international mechanisms and then I'll chair the second half of the forum which will look at um, transnational solidarity, looking at questions of racialised policing and internationalised resistance. Melanie Barrichera, who's been central to organising this forum, who's the president of Alianza here, will be chairing the question and answer session at the end. Before we start, I want to do a special shout out and thank you to Gabby Follett from the Human Rights Program for all the work that she's done in making this event happen. And to recognise that this event is um, the work of the collaboration of 20 different organisations here at the Harvard Law School and to thank everyone who, um, who helped make it happen. Just a quick note also that it's being recorded, um, so to be aware of that. So quickly to introduce all our guests who are so d I'm so delighted could be here today. First, we have Asha ransby Spawn who was a member of the We Charge Genocide delegation that travelled from Chicago to Geneva. Next to her, we have Justin Hansford, an assistant professor at the St. Louis University School of Law, who's been at the forefront of legal organising and advocacy in the aftermath of the murder of Mike Brown. Patrice Marie Coulters, who's a Los Angeles-based organiser and co-founder of the Black Lives Matter, who in January went on Focus and Solidarity tours to the UK and to Palestine. Sharika Shaw, who's an organiser at Dream Defenders and was a member of the Palestine delegation. Mina Jagannath, who's a lawyer and co-founder of the Community Justice Project in Miami. Fernando Ribeiro Delago, who's a clinical instructor at the International Hu um, Human Rights Clinic here at the Harvard Law School. And Bella Krishna and Raji Bagopal, who's the assistant professor and founding director of the Program on Human Rights and Justice at MIT. So I'll hand over to Deborah. Thank you, Julia. And again, thank you and welcome to everyone. Um, so just to jump right in, I wanted to start by, talk, by asking um, Asha and Justin and Mina, um, the three of you recently went to Geneva um, to attend and to advocate uh, for these, about these issues before the committee, UN Committee Against Torture when the U.S. was being reviewed and, and some of you have been engaged in other um, recent appeals to the international human rights mechanisms and so I wanted to get your thoughts as to why, why did you decide and why did your organizations decide to take the struggles in Chicago, Miami and, and Ferguson to the UN um, what, was, what, dis, what role did that decision play in the larger strategy? Um, what was the experience like? And um, what were the, any surprises that you encountered? Also, for you to touch on what kinds of outcomes came out of that process, and um, what are some of the limitations, and what do you do now? So there's a lot of questions. Feel free to take, pick and choose which one, but these are, um, we thought we would start out there. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, and thank you for the invitation. It's uh, it's a real honor to be on this panel with people that I love and uh, and work with and respect very much. Um, <clears throat> so just a little bit a bit about me um, as a lawyer who works uh, directly with groups and movements that are led by those <coughs> most impacted by social injustice in the U.S. Um, I and as well as my colleagues, we seek to use uh, whatever legal tools we have at our disposal to um, build the power of uh, those groups and movements and uh, to elevate the objectives, uh, their objectives. My background is in international human rights and so um, prior to coming to Miami I was actually practicing in Haiti and in a lot of other international contexts and so um, when I came to Miami about two and a half years ago it was interesting for me to, to, to try and figure out how to bring that background to bear on my work locally. 
Um, since uh, the killing of Trayvon Martin and, um, and now Ferguson, um, the U.S.'s human rights record, I think, has come under increasing international scrutiny, and I think um, that has provided us an, uh, an interesting opportunity to actually engage a little bit more with the international community about um, what's happening in the U.S. and to uh, try to bring another sort of pull of pressure on, on the U.S. to um, to take a closer look at itself. Um, I think that right now there's, uh, you know, 50 years since some of the, the major gains of the civil rights movement there are now questions about how, um, how much we actually gained and how much further actually we have to go to really deal with um, racial inequality in the U.S. And so, um, you know, as people's trust in, in the U.S. justice system arose, and in particular um, people of color and black people, uh, the black communities in the U.S., um, I think that people are increasingly starting to, to look to other forums in which to air their grievances, to talk about what's happening in the U.S., and to, um, and to agitate for, for change. And so, in my view, um, there are two iterations of, of human rights. There's a state-centered, um, etatized uh, uh, version of, of human rights, which is um, the more formalistic, you know, human rights legal um, frameworks, and then um, and then there's also the conception of human rights as it comes from people's movements, as an empowering discourse and a way that um, that people uh, agitate for for more just um, structures, state structures, and just um, institutions. And so I'm I'm more concerned with with the people's version of the human rights, but um, but. You know, on the state-centered formal side, I think that there are some ways that we can use um, UN treaty body processes and Inter-American Commission for Human Rights and other kinds of um, accountability mechanisms to um, for for a number of different things. One, to deepen our advocacy, so to um, you know provide another place in which to um, talk about the the objectives that we have. Um, Number two is to create another source of pressure um, for change in the U.S. government, especially as these processes interplay and interact um, with foreign policy and um, political, you know, geopolitics. And then three, to be platforms for storytelling, um, healing, and building of ties with uh, with international movements. Um, so that that all is, uh, you know, with the caveat that we, you know, our resort to the UN, it doesn't come from like a blind faith that those institutions will um, be the enforcer of, uh, you know, human rights in the U.S. But they have other, you know, uses, uh, more rhetorical uses in a way. And um, you know, 50 years since Malcolm X and other leaders there um, sort of uh, view that the UN could be a site to combat U.S. imperialism, um, racism, and inequality, um, we now have a more sort of nuanced and sober view of what's actually accomplishable in those forums. Um, so, uh, you know, we're realistic about the, the limitations and even the drawbacks of using those forums, but, um, but that being said, you know, with our eyes wide open, um, we have a couple of different strategic opportunities to, um, to engage with the UN and other such mechanisms um, to start to shift Americans, uh, the, you know, the average American's conception that human rights abuses happen abroad and at home were great. And, uh, and then to also start to place a microscope on, on the US um, and, and its own human rights record. So one example of this, uh, of the way that we've used these forums, is um, a recent uh, delegation to uh, to the UN um, in November of, of last year for the UN Committee Against Torture's review of uh, of the US for its compliance under the Convention Against Torture. Um, a, a number of us traveled there. Asha uh, had traveled with with a group of uh, of activists and young people from Chicago. Justin was part of the delegation as well as um, the parents of. Michael Brown and um, and several other um, young leaders that have been really active in the movement um, in St. Louis and in Ferguson. Um, we uh, you know the we had mixed thoughts about about what had what was accomplished there, but I think that um, it was uh, for us a um, a win to see uh, international forums acknowledge what 
our uh, <coughs> government here was not willing to acknowledge, which is that we have a serious problem with um, impunity for police crimes, that um, the militarization of the police is, um, is horrifying and has really um, uh, disastrous effects um, both on you know, activism and people's ability to speak out, but then also on um, you know this uh, broadening and deepening of the police state in the U.S. Um, I think that uh, some of some of my other colleagues are going to talk a little bit more about about the limitations of those forums. So I just wanted to just um, go back to talking about um, sort of what our our rationale was for for using this, and I think. Um, one of it is is to is to use these inter international accountability mechanisms to um, reposition these mechanisms away from only concentrating on the third world or the global south and the the human rights issues that face them, but then also to talk about the way in which um, you know the u s s failure to deal with the legacies of slavery, the legacies of Jim Crow have actually reproduced structures that are similar to like post colonial structures in countries like Africa and India and other places that that never actually came to terms with um, with sort of the, the vestiges of colonialism. We also start to um, change sort of the face of, of, um, of human rights violations and, and, and start to try and, and build, um, build uh, solidarity with movements that, that use those spaces and that also agitate against um, those state-centered spaces like the UN, um, like countries like Palestine and Western Sahara, basically peoples that are fighting for self-determination and whose voices are actually not uh, elevated to the same level in those forums. And, um, and we start to sh shift away from uh, a simply civil rights frame towards a human rights frame that, that incorporates um, uh, economic, social, and cultural rights and a, um, a, a broader view, uh, it, it uses a global frame versus uh, the civil rights frame, which is uh, a primarily domestic frame. And so that gives us more opportunities to start to um, be able to converse and start to see the links between the, the, the structures of oppression that actually um, cross borders and uh, that impact uh, communities around the world. I think my time is up, so I will stop. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. <laughs> so, um, so again, I'm Asha, um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the delegation that I went on to the United Nations that Mina mentioned, um, which was called We Charge Genocide. Um, it was a, a collective, um, an initiative, not an organization pre-existing before this this project um, that came together after. Um, a boy about a year older than me uh, named Dominique Franklin was killed by the Chicago Police Department. Um, and Miriam Caba, who's a dope prison abolitionist organizer in Chicago, who's um, really been kind of one of the most important mentors to folks my age, I'm 21 years old, um, who are organizing and doing this work in Chicago. Um, and she called for this meeting, um, and it was a a group of people that came out of a kind of existing network, a lot of different organizations. I'm part of the Black Youth Project 100, which was one of them. Um, Black and Pink Chicago Chapter, um, which is an LGBTQ uh, 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 anti-prison organization, um, along with others, um, which included some lawyers who had worked on um, cases of people who had been victims of police torture under the um, John Burge Reign of the Chicago Police Department, who've been working to get folks who were um, who were locked up on life sentences, get them out of prison, who had been locked up on false confessions because of torture. Um, so people who were really coming from from a lot of different angles to the work. People who were doing legal advocacy, people who were doing direct service, people who were doing direct action and policy work, um, kind of came together and are like, what are we going to do? Um, and so this idea came to. Um, resurrect the project of We Charge Genocide, which comes from, which the name comes from um, in 1951, a group of civil rights activists 
went to the UN and took um, the cases of the killings of black people in the United States to the United Nation um, to charge the US with um, what, what they were calling genocide, right? Um, and when we look at the definition of genocide that the United Nations uses, um, the ways that we see black communities in this country being systematically policed, harassed, abused, and killed um, really does fit into that definition. And so it's not, um, it's not a metaphor or a hyperbole or an exaggeration when we use this word. We're using it um, for a particular political reason. Um, and, and part of that being that we don't see um, kind of international bodies like the UN um, or even in whatever like activist discourse, we don't see words like genocide being used um, pointing to powerful nations like the United States um, that in these spaces posit themselves as being um, the kind of global markers for humane you know, national ethics um, or democracy. And what we do is we really challenge that kind of hierarchy. We, we challenge these hierarchies that are racialized globally, um, but also racialized within um, nations when we point out things like genocide and when we point out state violence um, that's actually happening by the US, um, despite it framing itself in a certain way. Um, so, word. so we came up with this project of going to the United Nations, um, we spent the summer compiling a shadow report um, about police violence against youth of color in Chicago. Um, and we, you know, it was hand in hand, we were collecting data, um, but we were also collecting people's stories. Um, and so our, our report reflects that and the kind of style that we went to the UN reflected that was that we were lifting up real people's stories. Um, and we were a delegation of eight young people of color living in Chicago who went to the United Nations. Um, which is not what most of the people who go and present at the UN look like. Um, it's not young, like we were the youngest people there. It's not people who are directly impacted by these issues. It's usually, I mean, and sometimes it is, um, but it's like folks like the ACLU, it's lawyers um, who, who oftentimes are speaking on behalf of people, um, which is cool that they get to do that. Um, and they have a certain set of skills that I don't have um, in order to maneuver those spaces. But we went to the UN, um, as ourselves, speaking for ourselves, um, and and presented our report. Um, we ended up doing two kind of protests in the United Nations. Um, while we were there, we did um, a, a walkout on one of the first days when the when the U.S. government, um, in response to our claims that less than two percent of cops who were charged with 10 or more serious complaints in the Chicago Police Department have any kind of accountability. And that means like they're not getting a one day suspension and they're not getting a talking to. I'm not talking about people getting fired. Um, when we say there's no accountability for police and the US government um, responds with, oh, we've looked into 300 cases in the last five years around the country. Um, and that's just, you know, not a legitimate response to us. Um, anyway, so we were faced with this kind of, these defenses that the US was making, um, but ultimately were surprised at how welcomed our arguments as kind of off kilter they were in this United Nations human rights environment um, were taken by the UN Committee Against Torture. Um, and they, in the report that they ended up publishing out of this uh, convening, they called out specifically the Chicago Police Department, specifically police violence against youth of color, and specifically um, our friend Damo's name, um, which is not something that you know we ever imagined that Dominique Franklin, who was not like he wasn't a Trayvon Martin or even a Mike Brown, um, like he was caught shoplifting, um, and he didn't deserve to die from one, from that. Um, but Damo's story was not one of the stories that we ever thought would make it in the headlines. Um, let alone make it in this UN report. Um, so it's kind of just a little bit about our project going to the United Nations. All right, so uh, honored to be on this panel to, to be with so many amazing activists. I'm the only one who brought a PowerPoint along with me, so uh, please bear with me. <clears throat> so 
My story actually begins in Brazil, oddly enough. When I, in 2004, after I was a 1L, I spent my summer working for a human rights organization called Connectus Human Rights in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, at the time, I was um, doing music. I was doing hip hop music. And I had a friend who was a victim of police brutality. And um, I got a chance to experience uh, what it's like to see state-sponsored violence on a, on a very intense level. In Brazil, they have, uh, I think in 2013, over 2,000 killings uh, by police uh, in, a, in a single year. And um, it was that experience which really helped me to dive into the issue of police brutality. I'd already done activism before going to law school. Uh, but at this point, I knew deeply that, um, like Huey Newton said, I wanted to make sure that whatever skills I used, I didn't allow them to be something that was dominated by a desire to help the bourgeoisie class. I wanted to make sure it helped the masses. And so I was inspired by my time in Brazil. Um, and then by the time, almost 10 years later, I found myself in Ferguson, living about 10 minutes outside of Ferguson when the Mike Brown case happened. Um, I knew that this was something that I was meant to be involved in. And so um, to me, you know, this, hap this happened, of course, in the context of what we call the new Jim Crow. Um, African Americans make up about 13% of the national population, but over 43% of the prison and jail population. And um, you compound this with the killings, and um, you know this is a, a gruesome picture to show, but I thought that Mike Brown's killing was a fresh cut in an old wound, the wound of lynching in America. Um, and there's a song by Billie Holiday called Strange Fruit, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, when I saw Mike Brown's body, I felt like it was the same as this picture. It was the same as Strange Fruit uh, swinging in the, in the southern breeze. I used to show uh, the picture of Mike Brown's dead body, but uh, Mike Brown's mother actually asked me um, never to show that picture because I, I've been with her when that's triggered her before. And you know, I've seen the, the devastation that this incident and these incidents have had on families throughout uh, the nation and throughout our community. And so um, it's a very, very, uh, a very intense situation and you know this happens in the context of militarized policing. This is a picture from a uh, police department in Miami, which used these black bodies as target practice. So we, you know we live in a world where black bodies are seen as objects, and there's a long legacy of this. So during slavery, in order to turn the black body into a commodity, before that it had to be an object so that you could make it a commodity. So that never was undone. And the legacy, one of the legacies of colonialism and slavery is the continuation of the objectification of the black body. You see that play out through our police departments around the country. And then you add on the militarization of policing and the use of racial profiling. And you've got a uh, terrible mix, you know, and as you, some of you have, raise your hand if you've read, read the DOJ report, about half of you have, more than half of you have. So you know about the, the way that uh, policing was used for revenue as opposed to uh, in order, to, as opposed to a method for keeping the community safe. Um, and so you combine that with racial profiling and the militarization of police, and you've got a situation where uh, young people of color, particularly young black people, are, fi are finding themselves um, in situations where there's state-sponsored violence targeting them. And so we protested in Ferguson that went around the nation. Uh, we were responded to with police dogs, uh, tear gas. This is an eight-year-old who uh, was tear gassed um, during the protests. Um, rubber bullets were shot. Um, you know, a lot of these rubber bullets and tear gas were deployed during times when you had uh, children and strollers who were out there at the protests, old people in wheelchairs. Um, this is someone who had a, a rubber bullet wound. It's a pastor named Renita Limpkin. And I, I always show this picture just to demonstrate that although some people may tell you rubber bullets are not as lethal or not as dangerous as real bullets. Uh, rubber bullets can kill, and they leave horrible, disfiguring uh, injuries. And some of us were arrested, um, including some of us um, who are here on this panel today. Um, so this is a picture of an arrest that took place during a protest in a Walmart. And um, you know, one of our leaders here, Patrice Colors, uh, was also right there with me getting arrested um, during this incident. I had on uh, a neon green 
hat, which I received from the National Lawyers Guild because I was designated as an official legal observer. And that neon green hat uh, was supposed to protect me from any sort of arrest or anything uh, dangerous happening. You can see how much good that neon green hat did for me. Um, so this is something that uh, continues to be a, a, a case that we're facing. Uh, so the, the plea deal for us was uh, two years probation and a lifetime ban from all Walmarts all across the country. <laughs> and um, you know, we're still waiting to figure out if that was a reward or a punishment or what, <laughs> what that was about. But um, you know, there were over 700 demonstrators who were arrested uh, during these protests, and I was, I was just one of them. Um, but you know, as lawyers, we felt that we should be engaged on the ground doing work to uh, make sure that this transformation reached the masses. We did Know Your Rights workshops. We tried to change the narrative in the media, went to law schools like this one, uh, engaged in advocacy on the state, local, and federal level. Um, but one thing we found was, in general, these state, local, and federal mechanisms wanted to give us only superficial solutions and give us short-term um, answers. And so we went to Geneva um, with uh, many people, dynamic people like Tef Poe, um, Tara DeMont, uh, artists, activists, poets, and um, you know, we also were able to go with Mike Brown's uh, mother. And one thing I want to say is that you know, all the legal arguments we put together to get to Geneva, the shadow reports, the, the briefs, none of them compared to the testimony that Mike Brown's mother was able to, to make when she went there and tried to describe what it was like to lose her only son. So you know, some of us were there in the room. There wasn't a dry eye in the room when she spoke. Uh, this is someone who had to stand out there in the hot sun for over four hours while her son's dead body lay in the street. And she tried to talk about what her son meant to her, and she, you know, she couldn't even finish her presentation. She was so uh, emotional. And I think that's what made the biggest impact on the United Nations and really made it something that uh, allowed her to have her voice recognized, um, allowed the movement to be amplified. After her testimony, uh, the, the commission responded and said, Yes, you know, police brutality is a major issue. Um, you know, she felt that her dignity was recognized, her voice was heard. It's a shame she had to go all the way to Geneva, Switzerland, to have her dignity recognized. Um, but that's one potential positive outcome that you can see from these human rights mechanisms. It allows people the opportunity to, to have their dignity recognized when the state, local, and federal governments are refusing to do so. Um, so this is something that, again, we felt that we were living out the dream of our heroes. Like, for example, Malcolm X, who always, uh, towards the end of his life, said that he wanted the United Nations to hear what it was like to face uh, racism in the United States. And he, um, you know, Marcus Garvey had done this as early as the 1920s. There's a long history in black critical thought of using the international forum and the United Nations uh, to get redress. Um, and of course, going forward, I look at Nelson Mandela, I'm going to be spending um, some time in South Africa um, in the coming months, and um, I look at what he was able to do using the international forum, using the UN as a part of one of his tools uh, to try to create change. And I feel like just like the Free South Africa movement, this movement against racial profiling and police brutality is going to depend on going outside of the United States uh, to get redress. And one more thing I want to add. I want to show this picture of Jesse Hernandez. This was a, a young woman who was killed in Denver, uh, LGBT youth, um, who um, you know, was, a vic was victimized by this problem. This is not just a problem facing young black men. This is a problem facing people from all different uh, range of experiences. And uh, you know, we have to recognize the intersectionality issues that are, that are taking place the way um, a certain toxic form of masculinity uh, creates an incentive for police to use brutal tactics. And so as we expand beyond the domestic, we also have to expand beyond purely masculine ways of addressing this problem. So that's it for me, thanks. Thank you. Um, just wanted to add one more question to this section, which is, Raj, maybe if you could comment on um, putting this in the, adding to the historical context, specifically sort of more about why in the United States we talk more about civil rights and human rights and its relationship to the anti-colonial struggles. Sure. Um, 
So uh, to me, just listening to these uh, just uh, tells me how much the U.S. civil rights movement has changed and how it's driven in a different direction by activists and younger people, youth movements, uh, in a way that 20 years ago the civil rights movement wasn't quite thinking about it in those terms. Um, I mean, the, 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 the relationship between the U.S. and the U.N. Uh, was always fraught, you know, right from the go, get-go. As you know, uh, U.S. has never been a willing player on the international level, never really taking international law seriously or complying with it. This goes back to the League of Nations, but um, right after the founding of the U.N., the U.S. made it quite clear its unwillingness to be bound in any formal way by rules of international law, particularly it exempted itself from the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice, pretty much writing an amendment that guaranteed that. Uh, and the human rights field was very contentious because of the Cold War. And uh, for the US, the question of race was always international in that sense because US's relationship was with, especially with the Soviet Union was, was seen through the prism of race. And, and the background to that was, of course, that uh, the white supremacist order was under challenge everywhere. It was under challenge domestically by the US civil rights movement because, as you know, uh, right from the 1940s, um, many decisions from the Supreme Court had come out that, for example, held the US, the white primaries illegal or that actually declared racially restrictive covenants illegal. Uh, and then, of course, we have the Brown versus Board of Education judgment. But at the same time, there is a rising tide of uh, anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism led by popular movements under the yoke of colonialism in different countries. And that comes to a head at the same time there was a sense of solidarity between what was happening domestically and what was happening internationally. For example, there was this famous conference of the first conference of Afro-Asian countries in Indonesia called Bandung, Bandung Conference. It's 60 years actually. Um, and the Bandung Conference was extraordinary because the extent to which the rest of the world, the Afro-Asian world, took the issue of race to be a global theme and really looked at what was happening within the United States as something that they were deeply concerned about. Um, and uh, the US certainly saw its relations, its foreign relations, you know, uh, through the prism of racial discrimination issues within the United States. Um, so, I mean, um, what that tells us, I think, uh, is uh, something very important, which is that I think reflecting back on it, uh, it, of course, despite the intellectual recognition of the need to internationalize the U.S. civil rights struggle, I'm thinking of the, the, the use of the term global color line by Du Bois, and of course, we have, uh, you know, we have uh, Malcolm X's embrace of human rights as opposed to U.S. civil rights. But as you know, it was the entrenching of the civil rights laws, particularly during the 1960s, managed in a significant way to sort of position the U.S. civil rights movement more towards inside rather than outside. And that actually created maybe roughly a 30-year gap in the history of the U.S. civil rights struggles in terms of the connection with international movements and solidarity movements. It became much more U.S. focused. And I would say that the, probably the first time when the U.S. civil rights movement began to show its restlessness to break out of this was probably the Durban conference in 2001, the racism conference, because it came out of the broader conversation about reparations. And reparations has been such a big theme in the US civil rights movement, it still is. Of course, my, totally ignored by the mainstream press and mainstream scholarship, but it's an extraordinarily central part of the US civil rights movement, and globally, it was a central part of the struggle against colonialism and, and racism, and still remains so. In fact, you know, for those of you who are interested, the Caribbean countries have just kind of negotiated a kind of a, a deal, a kind of an acknowledgement of colonialism and possibly a reparations award. Um, so there are a lot of very interesting moving pieces um, that, are, that, that are, I think, linked to by the new wave of the civil rights movement that I see here, uh, which is going in an extraordinarily interesting direction. The second uh, thing I would say uh, is, uh, in terms of what we can learn from this history, which was that politically there was a lot of connection between the US civil rights movement domestically and the struggles for global racial equality 
and non-discrimination in formerly colonized countries. But at the same time, interestingly enough, the UN was very weak and didn't have any of the structures, for example, the treaty bodies or the UPR mechanism. The, this is a universal periodic review, which is a, like a peer review mechanism in the UN where states agreed to sort of be reviewed by each other. The US, for example, just went through one, submitted its report in February. Um, none of these mechanisms existed. The treaties, none of the central treaties existed. The legal opportunities that many of you are exploiting very cleverly didn't exist at that time. Although there was an intention on the part of the US civil rights leaders to embrace the UN, there wasn't much there, there in terms of the structures. But what was there was very important, which was a political solidarity. Mm -hmm. There was a political solidarity with the rest of the world, which oddly enough, now we have a lot of structures, but the political solidarity has evaporated. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have the political solidarity between, say, the US civil rights movement's uh, post-Ferguson push with um, the political solidarity of the third world as a bloc. The third world as a bloc has melted away. In, judged in terms of third world as states. Mm -hmm. um, and what you have is the space for transnational movement mobilization and transnational movement solidarity, but not at the state level, which goes back to Mina's point, um, but it's more at the level of movements within different countries trying to exploit whatever dissident spaces that exist within the UN system, within the inter-American system, within their own national systems, to try to figure out how they can get even an acknowledgement of sufferings of, of deep-rooted injustices that don't seem possible at the national level. Because the national level states have become very clever, too clever by half. Yes. If you look at the US report to the, under the UPR, for example, the US report goes something like this. It says that a lot of uh, overwhelming number of police officers are absolutely wonderful people. They're doing a great job. There are a few <laughs> rotten apples. You know, of course, you know, we're trying very hard to actually address those problems. And here are the number of prosecutions we launched under the right. DOJ and all of these statistics, right? And by the way, this is actually a fairly considered and fairly rational response compared to the responses of many other states right. under the UPR. Yeah. Now, when you have a scenario like this, it becomes very hard to figure out whether you're really engaging with something meaningful right. in the absence of the broader issue of politics exactly. and political mobilization, or are we going through the, the technicalities of procedures in the UN and other systems, which, of course, as lawyers, for those of us who are lawyers, is wonderful. It appeals to <laughs> we get to deploy our skills and so on. But in the end, what, what, do, you, what do you get out of it, really? Uh, uh, so I, that's a question that I want to put before the panel in terms of it's great to go to Geneva. It's wonderful to you know, submit petitions and so on. But the states are out petitioning all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're doing it in a way where it becomes very hard to use the system to go after them. The system always has a checkmate box, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, to me, that, that's a fundamental issue. And I would say we have to bring it back to politics and bring it back to politics in a way that connects with, for example, um, movements that struggle for equality, racial equality, such as indigenous people's movement, racial minorities, ethnic minorities, religious minorities in Europe, and so on, but with two other movements that actually used to be robust, that civil rights movement fleetingly engaged with but no longer does, which is the peace movement, which is totally connected to the question of militarization. If you're truly concerned about militarization of policing, one has to be able to link with movement that challenge the use of US military and the militarization of you know, the planet, which is connected to the militarization of policing within the United States. The other uh, 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 part of it that I think is, uh, is very important to engage with is, uh, is, the, is the question of uh, class, and particularly the, the, the movements that actually stand against uh, the expropriation of natural resources and of the planet's uh, resources and of the exclusive domination of uh, the planet's resources by the 1%. And that needs to be a connection with uh, the broader, you know, the deeper roots of domination 
uh, of which the racial domination and the police abuses are only symptoms. And following on from that, I want to turn to Patrice and Sharika and ask you about some of the work that you've done recently in building that sort of transnational movement to movement solidarity in the struggles against um, racialized injustice and particularly the decision to take transnational solidarity delegations to the UK, to Brazil, to Palestine. What were some of your expectations? What were some of your motivations? What were some of the key surprises that came out of these delegations? And also, what were some of the learnings in terms of both commonalities, in terms of the structures of oppression that were being faced, and also the tactics of resistance um, and community organising that were happening in all these places? Can we open up the circle a little bit? Mm -hmm. Because the room is a little broader than we are. <laughs> that way. We don't have our backs turned to some of you. All right, awesome. Um, thank you all so much for having me here. Uh, my name is Sharika, and I live in Miami, Florida. And I'm an organizer with the Dream Defenders. So lately, the Dream Defenders have had a couple of really amazing opportunities to go on a couple of different delegations. Um, we've gone to Brazil, um, where we were able to visit uh, the MST, where their motto is um, occupy, um, resist, and produce. So their movement is a lot, a lot about taking over land and then on that land resisting, you know, having to leave and then producing. So from gardening to education to just living on that space and like really um, occupying it, right? Um, we've had the opportunity to go to Mexico um, where we were able to engage with a couple of the organizations there around the 43 students that were disappeared. Um, and then, of course, we were able to go to Palestine, um, where we were able to build with a lot of different organizations there and folks there and learn more about the movement um, there. And then another really cool opportunity was also going to Jamaica, where that was more of a, like a service trip, but we were also able to speak with some of the academics there on what's happened in Jamaica over um, the years and where the movement's kind of at there as well. So I guess I'll start with... Um, Mex with uh, Brazil, and I personally wasn't able to go on that trip, um, but with a lot of the folks who had went and came back, they talked a lot about the, the movement there being very, what's the right word? They were just more like outspoken, right? So like there's some language here that in the movement that we don't constantly use, um, where we won't come right out and say something like white supremacy, or we won't you know, come right out and say something like uh, patriarchy or capitalism or imperialism. That's not really language that we use, or it's, it's a little bit weird or threatening if we call ourselves militants or comrades, um, where in places like Brazil, that is a common thing and that's common language that they use and it's a lifestyle that they live. Um, MST has been around for 30 years where people have been born into the organization, um, where they're living on the land in tents at times, um, where folks are going through political education, like here we go to university, you're part of MST, you're going through MST school and you're learning political education. So. For them, going and coming back, we kind of felt like there's so much more that we need to do as organizers and activists um, here in the United States to really challenge um, what's here. Uh, so that was really, really inspiring. Um, I think another thing that folks took away from being in Brazil was the idea of what well, resistance, right? Like we say things like our very existence is resistance, but wh what does actual like resistance look like um, in action? And for the people there, being able to take land, like take land and occupy that land and refuse to move, it's kind of like an action that we, we do. In June Defenders, we did an action where we took over the Capitol for 31 days and we stayed there and we slept there and that was an experience, but we left, right? We didn't say, this is our Capitol, actually we're gonna go ahead and ask you to leave this office and bring some of our folks in the office and like not leave, right? Um, that's not something that we did, but kind of challenging, um, what does it look like for us to, to really resist um, in ways that our comrades are resisting in Brazil. Um, I would say that in Mexico, we had uh, three women go to Mexico where they went to a conference that they were having there. And 
from what I'm hearing about what's going on in Mexico, that's another like nudge, right? Where we have to, as being in the belly of the beast, so to speak, as being um, folks from the United States, and another really cool thing was us calling ourselves Americans. They're like, wait a minute, this is also America. <laughs> Check yourself on your privilege. Um, so language just a, was a really, really dope thing, and it made us kind of, um, even languages, right? Usually in um, social justice spaces, um, we don't have as many translators as we should, or the entire training will be in English, and then there's a translator for those who speak other languages, um, and that was also like a point of privilege that was checked, just being in a space when you, where you want to engage, and there being a language barrier, and, not, and us not always taking that into consideration. Um, so in Mexico, uh, the folks there are doing geopolitical mapping where they are mapping out like power dynamics in their country and in their states. Um, and that being something that was really inspiring coming back here, the folks that were um, actually disappeared in Mexico were folks that were going to a school to become educators in a rural, a rural community. Um, and just thinking about the power of education, um, whether it be political education for our organizations or education in general, um, was another really, really important thing that folks took back from that. Um, the folks in Mexico are in the process of rewriting their constitution, which I think is a really, really big thing. Um, and they are in a place where they're going to present this to their government. And there's obviously going to be some friction there on whether something like this is accepted or not ex um, accepted, and then the steps and process after that. Um, so yeah, I, you know, Dream Defenders, we um, are, are moving in a place where we constantly see um, the importance of trans um, National internationalism and like under, understanding, you know, why we need to make those connections, and even understanding how the different like oppressions are affecting us here and abroad. Um, for me, going to Palestine, I'm, I'll let Patrice kind of talk about that a lot more because she was there as well. But for me, going to Palestine um, and constantly hearing about it, the company G4S um, here in the states, when we're talking about mass incarceration and the new Jim Crow, G4S is a part of the conversation uh, as a company that you know benefits and profits from private prisons, um, and that's kind of the context, right? If you're not not going to a prison, you're not really hearing about G4S, you'll hear something here and there about, you know, um, officers in schools, but that's it. And in, G in Palestine, G4S is a big deal because when you think about the wall that's separating families from family and occupying space, these are the folks who are, are there, right? These are the folks who are in the towers, these are the folks who are patrolling the area. Um, thanks. <laughs> and you know, for me, I, I think that was a big takeaway for us among so many things. I think I'm not really doing it all justice right now because there's so much, but um, seeing that those who are oppressing us, like literally who are oppressing and, and, and incarcerating us here um, and are doing the same thing in Palestine. Um, and then of course, along with a lot of other things I'm sure Patrice will touch on, so. Mm -hmm. So I'm just giving, can you ask the question again? I just wanted to hear about your motivations and your experiences of transnational solidarity tours and the learnings that came out of that and Great. where you think, see this going. Got it. Um, and question, is this a no curse zone? Am I allowed to curse or not? I always need to ask. What, no, no cursing? I think curse. Curse, okay, great. I just need to make sure. I curse a lot and then I've been in some space and they're like staring at me and I'm like, I'm sorry, you should tell me not to curse, I won't. Um, so I'm Patrice Cullors, I'm a founder of Dignity and Power Now, which is a local organization in Los Angeles fighting the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. Um, both it's uh, the ways in which it's abusing folks inside LA County jails, but also fighting against um, their incessant need to continue to build more jails in Los Angeles. So um, those are we have two big fights, fighting for civilian oversight, which we've won, and we're in negotiations right now with the Sheriff's Department. And thank you. And, um, and fighting against a $3.5 billion jail project, um, which would be the largest capital project that's ever happened in Los Angeles County. I'm also the co-founder of Black Lives Matter. Myself, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi created the, the hashtag and networking project in 2013 after the murder of Trayvon Martin. Um, 
And what I will say, uh, what, what's important, I think, in this conversation around transnational solidarity is um, that it's simple. Like We should be building relationships with people across the world. Um, if we believe we're part of the human uh, family, then, then um, we need to sort of push ourselves in particular ways to see the connections always. Um, the other thing I'll say is Palestine is our generation in South Africa. And if, <laughs> if, if we don't step up uh, boldly and courageously to end the, the imperialist project that's called Israel, um, we're doomed. And I think that I, I had learned about Palestine for a long time. I had known about it, been wanting to travel, and I was really, really grateful when the Dream Defenders um, asked me to become on the delegation. Uh, but nothing would have prepared me for the level of milita militarization and the, uh, and the level of violence that we would witness those 10 days inside of Palestine. Um, nothing would have prepared me for uh, the ways in which um, we witness people's terror, uh, people live in terror on a daily basis. And um, nothing would have prepared me for how much clarity I would have on, on why we have to be a part of um, uh, Palestinian solidarity. And so for me, you know, the moment, um, um, we all had different experiences with the airport situation, have a whole conversation about that. Uh, many of us were, were questioned for hours at the airport. Um, we can have a whole conversation about the, the, the settlements that we, we witnessed, um, the, the stories of murder and death at the hands of Israelis and Zionists. And I think the biggest piece uh, uh, for me coming back home was, well, what, what do we do here, right? Um, What's our work look like here uh, in relationship to Palestine? And what does the Black Lives Matter movement have to do with Palestine? I know a lot of people ask that. A lot of black people ask that while we were there, right? We, got, we had great responses. People were super excited. And then we also had black people being like, why aren't you home? Like, I think there's like this deep gap in, in the black community, specifically amongst black Americans, because we can't assume all black people in the United States are American. Um, there's a gap that uh, we must deal with our issues at home as if our issues at home have nothing to do with the issues abroad. And so um, we understood that on, our, on coming back, we had to do a lot of education about why we chose to make this trip, um, why it was important to us, um, and why, it was ac why it's actually crucial to this conversation around um, this, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, when we talk about militarization, uh, when we talk about the ways in which the U.S. government funds, literally funds, uh, the state of Israel, um, we're complicit in that uh, unless we're fighting it actively, um, unless we're making those connections here um, inside of this country. And so um, it, it was an honor to go on that trip. And, and being back home, uh, a lot of us have been doing, um, uh, we've been talking to colleges and high schools and talking about our trip. But there's two things that I, I really want to uh, talk to this team about because I'm an organizer. So I don't just show up to talk, I show up to organize. Um, two things I think people should really be thinking about in relationship to the state of Israel and, um, and Palest Palestinian solidarity. One is BDS, Boycott Divestment Sanction. Um, and so if folks aren't on that tip, please Google it. It's super simple. Um, it's a great website. And the second is um, Resmia O'Day's case. Um, Resmia, who um, uh, lives in Chicago, and there's, it's a very long story, but essentially um, they will, they, the U US government is trying to deport her back to Israel, where she was tortured um, as a, a prisoner inside of, of Israel. And so I would really push this audience, um, whether it's the law school or students to develop some sort of Rasmia O'Day solidarity team to really, uh, I think this summer, um, we need to like get on it um, as a team. Uh, the, the media has essentially iced out everybody from talking out her, her case. And so um, we have our own media, it's called social media. Um, and I think we need to um, be, uh, I think we need to be diligent about uplifting her case. 
And then I didn't get to talk about the UK, but hopefully we'll go around to talk about it. But the UK was, um, I met with families who'd been impacted by state violence, mostly black families. And uh, the global consequences of anti-black racism are real. And um, international state violence is real. And even in a place that is the UK, that's supposed to be the humanitarian of the world, where their officers are unarmed, um, where they don't have militarized police, um, yet they're still killing black people at disproportionate rates, um, whether that's by strangling black folks, breaking black folks' necks, backs. And so um, I think that this conversation about um, global <coughs> racism and, and the consequences of anti-blackness globally is an important conversation. And it was um, uh, really powerful to sit with families, to go to the parliament, and to talk about the ways in which we're trying to fight uh, this country and its uh, racism, its patriarchy, its transphobia, its homophobia, um, and how we want to build internationally. Fernanda, following on from that, we've heard Brazil come up several times um, in this forum already. I want to ask you about your experiences in working against militarization of policing and mass incarceration in Brazil and what some of the learnings from that experience might be for the US struggles in the US. Thank you. It's, uh, it's an honor to be able to speak here with all of you. Um, open with a headline, an actual headline from Brazil. Uh, police will use Darth Vader-inspired masks in Rio de Janeiro protests. Um, this is a real headline, as I said. Uh, the masks were purchased by the Extraordinary Secretariat of Security for major events. Um, 2014, this was the last year, this headline, was of course the lead up to the World Cup and we have in 2016 the Olympics in Rio. Um, the article goes on to say that the seller in Brazil touted the look of the mask as a, uh, for psychological impact. Um, and uh, here we see the link very directly. The, the mask is made in the US. Um, it was reportedly, ha is in use by SWAT teams. Um, and its sale abroad must be licensed by the US State Department. Um, <coughs> When we think about uh, linkages uh, transnationally, um, going back to the history, um, there is this lag between movements here, activists here, not everybody, but in general, um, making that international solidarity and the aggressive nature in which uh, the actual tough on crime, broken windows, and all sorts of other um, policing strategies from the US were internationalized. So there was no gap, there is no lag time in the latter process. Um, and so in that sense, the, in, the solidarity movement is struggling to catch up, mm -hmm. right? And in Brazil, there, and, and this goes in both directions, but it is a very interesting story to trace from the US being here and myself being Brazilian, um, working on these issues, one thing that was triggering for me and not on anything like the scale of somebody directly, directly affected, but when Michael Brown's forensics report was printed on the cover of the New York Times, I, I had to step away from that article right. for a while right. because I've spent too many times looking at those drawings of mm. people with X's and other things all over their bodies. Um, <clears throat> in that research in Brazil, um, one thing we can say is that the problem, um, as has been expressed here in other contexts, uh, in many ways mirrors some of the issues here. So Brazil, uh, although there might be some issues of scale and time lags and so on. Police in Brazil killed six people per day from 2009 to 2013. Uh, that is only the data that is actually known. In many states, the full count is not counted um, in, within Brazil. Um, police target poor communities with disproportionately uh, large uh, percentages of black residents, uh, favela communities especially, urbanly. Um, in uh, controlling for population in Sao Paulo in 2011, you find that uh, uh, somebody who is black was targeted uh, for killing three times more than 
than whites um, that year. Um, and in yet another really disturbing mirror, um, Brazil, I would say, is on the path already quite a ways down towards mass incarceration um, and is following and sometimes literally inspired by U.S. models, oh, prefab prisons with designs architecturally coming from the U.S. and so on. Um, and again, in the last 20 years, the prison population of Brazil has grown 380 percent while the uh, population of the country has grown about 30 percent. Um, so uh, being familiar with the situation here in the U.S. and researching that and seeing Brazil uh, going through that process is incredibly agonizing and it is right. um, very important to connect with folks here who have been struggling around these issues for so long. Um, <clears throat> Of course, one other point of connection is uh, uh, blacks in Brazil are dis uh, proportionately more likely to be arrested, to be convicted, to be uh, uh, to take uh, court-appointed counsel as their only means of recourse and defense. And there we see intersectionality precisely with class, where whites earn 75% more uh, in their primary jobs than blacks in Brazil. Um, so in thinking about what uh, lessons might be drawn from the activism in Brazil around these issues, uh, I'd just like to quickly point out three things. Um, the first is that there are lots of things taken for granted in the U.S. legal structure and political structure that shouldn't be. Um, and that uh, can be mind-opening when you go elsewhere and you see whether it's the way people rhetorically use different words or the, the actual structures of the institutions. Uh, so transparency, I'm, I'm struck here by how unusual it was when the Ferguson grand jury documents came out and people finally got a little window into what that process really looks like and what the testimonies are like. In Brazil, any lawyer can go into the courthouse and get a copy of a case file of a police shooting. Um, because whether charges get filed or whether the uh, case gets shelved, and almost always it gets shelved, um, it eventually makes it into the courthouse and you can get a copy. In that way, we can map statistics, we can map the shooters, we can map repeat shooters, we can map uh, squads that disproportionately kill people. Um, and so transparency around those issues is possible. There are other societies that do it. Exactly. And here, um, it's taken as a given, like, oh, sorry, these are investigative methods. Clearly, we cannot discuss this. Look around the world, it's often quite discussed. Um, the second thing I'd point out is um, uh, to, to take a police phrase, follow the money, right? Uh, whether it's privatization of prisons, but our, some of the advocacy that has had more impact uh, that we've been a part of is the ones around police corruption and the link to, from, with police corruption and violence. Um, often piercing that narrative that is put out there, whether it's the rotten apples narrative because of the widespread nature of corruption, or the narrative around the quote unquote honest tough cop um, that is just doing what it takes to keep us safe, uh, when in fact you see that it is uh, often these same uh, police officers or squads within departments that are responsible for extortion rackets and various other things. They are uh, part of the crime problem in localities. They're not part of the solution. Um, and the third lesson I would say that uh, evaluating critically, again, the role of lawyers um, and how nice it can be to focus on process and use your skills and not get results is uh, uh, to beware not to focus too much on technocratic solutions to political problems. Mm -hmm. And here I would say um, to take the issue of militarization, for many years uh, activist lawyers in Brazil succeeded on a lot of legal grounds like withdrawing military justice jurisdiction over police killings of civilians. Um, various other things we can cite. But the actual decrease of a thousand killings in a year in Rio happened for a number of factors recently, but one of the key ones, I believe, was the switch 
social movements and lawyers focusing on the strategy, the enunciated politics of crime fighting in Brazil, the tough on crime rhetoric of the governor and so on, and, and how political decision making is perhaps the central factor in controlling this form of violence, um, that there is no form of restraint that legal or otherwise that you can place on a police force that is politically motivated, indicated, instigated to target, uh, to surveil and to equate communities of color with crime, right? That you actually need to take the, the fight politically. Um, so in the body cameras uh, debate that's going on here and various other debates, just I would say it can draw the focus away mm -hmm. from that kind of larger we conversation. Um, mm -hmm. Not that those things don't have uh, impact, but there you go. Mm -hmm. um, and lastly, I did say there were three, but just because we're in Boston, mm -hmm. um, there's a fourth. Mm -hmm. um, Boston recently won the US Olympic Committee bid to be an Olympic host. And here's another beware, Rio, is hosting the Olympics in 2016. Um, the popular committee for the World Cup and the Olympics in Brazil, which is a social movement, various umbrella, um, umbrella of various organizations, um, has documented over 3,000 families being displaced since 2009 for the construction projects, for various other things related to the games. There's any number of problems we can talk about. That's just a snippet. And if you think that's sort of a Brazil thing because perhaps the institutions are not as strong and, and there's transparency here and we have lawyers and so on, look to Atlanta and see that in 1996, Atlanta, the task force on the homeless there documented 9 thousand arrests of homeless people in the year before the Olympics, um, which was a fourfold increase from the prior three years, um, according to the New York Times. So the No Boston Olympics campaign um, right now is focusing on things like uh, cost issues, transparency issues, public money. That is all very, uh, those are important, those are deeply troubling issues, but I would also say from the Brazilian experience, from the Dominican Republic, Pan American Games experience, and from several others we can talk about, uh, look at also the cost of what will the Olympics, what would the Olympics do to the Boston police, to Boston architecture, to militarizing mm -hmm. police forces, and to who's gonna be arrested in the lead up to the games and where are they gonna be taken. Um, so that I haven't seen uh, personally that discussed as, uh, as much, but it's something that is, is definitely worth considering, so thank you. I'm just wary of the time, um, and so I want to open up the floor for questions so that we all have a chance to um, raise other questions that people might have, unless some of the panellists have got something they urgently want to say right now. Otherwise, I'd invite Melanie to come and chair the Q&A session. Yeah. <laughs> I've been giving the warning, yeah. So <laughs> while, while they're getting their questions together, uh, one thing that happened in the aftermath of the trip to the UN uh, was the public, the, the public attempt to try to shift the narrative. And I think speaking to your point about focusing more on politics than on technocratic points, um, it came out later that uh, Governor Nixon, in the lead up to the decision, had told the chief of police not to use tanks and not to use tear gas, not because he had suddenly taken a humanitarian turn, but he saw the press and, and he said, we don't want to look like uh, we're taking a militarized approach. We don't want to look like human rights violators. And I think, you know, as the cynic in me, I think, is, <laughs> has to agree, as long as politicians care more about their public image than about justice, you've got to make your strategy 
uh, applicable to what's really going to matter to them. And I think that's, that's one possible way that human rights can continue to be useful as long as it can be used to shift the narrative in some way, shape, or form and cause politicians to worry about being labeled human rights violators, it could be productive. Thank you so much for coming. It was really, it's really great, I think, at least for my own, like mental health to hear and see and learn from people like you in these spaces. So thank you very much. I'm Rena, uh, I'm a 2L, and I just had a question about the human rights, civil rights kind of framing because I'm taking constitutional law for the first time this semester. Um, and as someone who's interested in racial justice, like every single day, I'm just kind of struck with the inadequacy of like the Supreme Court or the Constitution or the Equal Protection Doctrine to kind of start doing the project of dismantling white supremacy here. Um, and I was wondering in the context of like, go, those of you who are in Geneva um, and being in a, in a similar kind of hall of power that's meant to kind of progress the rights of people, but that is also a project of kind of the globalized anti-black racism that you all spoke about. What were some of those similarities maybe to the issue of, of trying to enforce civil rights through the Supreme Court here? And in what ways was it different? I'll say I was surprised. Um, so one thing I feel like I should say um, about human rights, I think it's important to think about, I think the panel, um, and if I'm generalizing, correct me, um, is like arguing for the use of human rights in a, in a way that's strategic, maybe more so than ideological, um, and that utilizes the st structures in place that, are, that we have to enforce human rights around the world um, because the, the national structures that we have to enforce civil rights are inadequate. I would argue um, there is a very fine line and a danger um, with human rights where there's a difference between kind of a radical strategic use of these structures that are in place and a kind of ideological acceptance of a liberal human rights discourse, um, which, which is something that we see like in the protests, right? So like um, when, when we hear Black Lives Matter being kind of drowned out with this All Lives Matter, um, or we, you know, like many of us work in people of color organizations or black, I work in black youth organization, um, people being frustrated with us wanting to have those exclusive places for leadership um, and just kind of the ways that a, a universalist human rights discourse can actually, um, can actually work to depoliticize issues. And so at the end of the day, yeah, we want everyone to be valued because they're human. We don't have to fight to say that, but we do have to fight to say that we want black lives um, to be valued, and so understanding like that we can utilize these international structures for human rights, um, but we always have to be working to insert a ra an analysis of race and class um, and to politicize those spaces. Um, and I think for many of us who went to the UN, it's not necessarily um, going and existing within the, the rhetoric that's normally used at the UN, but it's seeing how far we can push the boundaries of what human rights really means if we're talking about it um, as something with political potential. That's great. Um, well, real, real quick, just to support that point, I once saw this cartoon where there was a, a house that was on fire and then there was a normal house and a fireman came up and he had a big fire hose, and he started spraying water on the normal house that wasn't on fire. And underneath there was a caption that said, all houses matter. <laughs> that, that's pretty much you know, this, that universalist discourse. And the, the, you know, of course the problem there though, I mean to give this a short counter argument, Mal one of the reasons Malcolm X towards the end of his life said that he wanted the movement to be more internationalized is because um, 
the, the conception of the movement as, as purely domestic, it, there's a long history of that. And so we're trying to find some, some, sort, of, uh, some sort of trigger, some sort of tool to move it so that it can be uh, connected to Palestine, connected to Brazil, connected to Mark Dugan, the UK. And human rights is the easy way to do that. Now, no, there are other ways to do that. You could take a pan-African approach. I'm a pan-Africanist. You can, you can, there are other international approaches. But the human rights approach is sort of a, a quick way to do that. And so again, I, I'm arguing more strategically than ideologically for the human rights approach. Um, just to add a little bit to that as well, um, we're talking a lot about Geneva, where we have to kind of go abroad um, and, and you know, kind of take up space there. Um, but here in the States, um, Amnesty International had a gathering um, in New York. And I wasn't a part of the space for the, the duration of the conference, but a lot of other folks from, from our organization, from BYP, folks from Ferguson, um, were experiencing a lot of like this, you know, all lives matter, of course human rights is an important thing, um, but in that space, not really acknowledging black lives, right? So folks there actually had a protest in that space with demands and holding like Amnesty International also accountable to black lives mattering and not just black lives in a sense of, you know, what's going on in the country as a whole, but even folks on their staff. So it's really important you know, for us to think about that abroad, but also those spaces that are being created here that are addressing like, human rights as well. Can I just add uh, one thing? I mean, I, I, I think it's not just the US, but most movements are strategic. It's not that move, you know, in countries people have a blind faith in the human rights framework. But the problem is you don't really know when your strategic move may be misappropriated as part of a broader ideological move that just sucks out the energy out of you. That's one issue. The other is that while everybody engages the system strategically, which might mean going to Geneva and all that, it, there is a question of pedagogy and awareness and education, which you mentioned where I do think that it, it, there is a lot of value to decentering an excessively nationalist narrative that you see in US constitutional courses, mm -hmm. for example, in terms of broadening the evaluation of rights from a cross-national or global perspective. Just take a very simple example. There is a UN basic principles on the use of firearms, which is a soft law instrument developed by the UN which actually provides a fairly detailed set of guidelines about the circumstances under which law enforcement personnel can use firearms. And it turns out that those standards are way beyond any standards that exist in the United States. But you don't actually find even constitutional lawyers aware of those things, or teaching about those things, or pushing people to think in terms of, okay, there may be other standards out there, you know, um, which goes back to your point about Brazil also. So there is a question of pedagogy and awareness raising which I think we have to carefully distinguish from the question of you know, falling too much in love with that system and using it strategically. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, thanks very much, and I want to congratulate all of you uh, for your work. Um, I'm Milun Kotari. I'm a visiting scholar at the MIT program on human rights and justice. I'm from India. Uh, first of all, I wanted to really salute you for your uh, tremendous support on Palestine. That's fantastic. It's very, it's not very common to hear that in an academic or any other arena in the United States and you're singling out Israel and pointing out the tremendous fault lines of Zionism. That, that's, that's really great. And second, I also wanted to salute you for embracing the human rights, um, you know, struggle and using the human rights terminology. Uh, I'm also a former special rapporteur from the UN on housing and I'm very aware of the system and it's great you're using it. But I wanted to bring the discussion back to what is happening in this country and not. Uh, one thing that surprises me having been here for the past two years is that movements are not sustained, right? So you have, you know, all the incidences in the school killings, the gun control, you have all the killings now of the black men and children. Um, and it was tremendous to see last semester the amount of student mobilization that took place at MIT and, and, and Harvard. And so it's great to see this event as well. But it, it's difficult to sustain. And I, I'm, I'm hoping uh, to hear some discussion from all of you on 
Why is that? I mean, why is it so difficult to keep people out on the street? Why is it so difficult to continue to hold the government accountable? Now, essentially, what I see in the US, the problem is that there's too little democracy. I think you really need to push for the US to be a democratic country, whether it's about transparency or accountability. And I think all of us need to be out there on the streets more. And, and you know, perhaps one answer would be uh, also to bring the people that you met in Brazil and elsewhere. I can think of Dalit activists from India, others here to go on national tours and talk about how they're holding, you know, what they're doing about state oppression, which is what it should, it is uh, really in their own country. So I really wanted to hear from all of you, what, what, what is the problem? Why isn't there more outrage in a, in a sustained, continuous manner? Thank you. I don't want to go. Um, well, one of the things that I was just going to mention was going, going to go back to um, Professor Rajagopal's uh, question about the state being the center and the state as nation. And, um, and one of the things that we're starting to think about, I'm, I'm in Miami with, with Sharika, and uh, one of the things that we're starting to, to talk about is how we uh, start to build our own structures and transform ourselves and, and actually educate our our communities politically to um, to uh, not ask for the solutions from the state, but try and see whether there are ways in which we can organize ourselves and um, and actually uh, build the kinds of institutions and alternative institutions that we would like to um, to sort of govern us. And so, um, I mean, I think part of the the issue is that when you focus on the government or when you focus on policy institution or policy solutions, sometimes, um, I mean, oftentimes there's compromise involved and, um, and oftentimes the kind of transformative de demands that you might have are always seen as too sort of pie in the sky, too unrealizable. And so one of the things that, that um, we've been discussing a lot is, uh, is, you know, how do you start to build structures that locally um, that can show the examples of the kind of democratic society, the kind of society that we would want to build, the kinds of ways that we can work together to hold each other accountable rather than have an outside police, uh, a force of control that is um, policing based on a legal regime that like we never had any feedback in constructing. And so, um, and so that you know, there's that. And I think you know, sort of the question for us lawyers then is, um, if if it's not that we are enforcing or activating an existing legal framework, then what is our use in helping movements and helping communities build these alternative institutions? And I think, I mean, I think that's a, you know, it's an evolving question. But but I do think that we need to ask ourselves, you know, if we are really going to be um, advocates in service of human rights, in service of the kinds uh, of building institutions that are, value human dignity and that are, um, you know, the, the goals of, of communities, then how, how can we use our tools or use whatever we have to, um, to help support uh, that vision? Um, so I think I have two responses. I think it's a great question. Um, I always look back to history to understand what's happening presently. I think there's been, uh, the state has organized itself to dismantle movements in this country. Um, there was a robust communist party. There was a robust civil rights and human rights um, movement, the Panther Party. Um, and we have been systematically uh, destroyed and decimated. And so we are literally um, left with the civil rights establishment, which is not a movement, um, which is often co-opted by um, police and elected officials. And uh, many of us are trying to uh, rebuild um, a human rights movement that is centered around fighting anti-black racism and centered around um, uh, organizing and building with poor people, uh, all poor people. So I think 
it's important to understand what has happened in this country and, and the ways in which the state has uh, consciously and purposefully destroyed our movements. Um, and then I think the second piece is nonprofits. Um, nonprofits uh, are a trap. Many of us are in nonprofits, many of us lead nonprofits, but we lead them and are in them um, being, being very skeptical, and we see it as a tactic and not the strategy. And so, um, but for many folks who are in nonprofits, um, and many of you will probably go on to join a nonprofit, uh, we see it as, they see it as a solution. Um, and we get stuck in funder-driven traps, and we get stuck in um, really uh, liberal narratives and we don't actually fight the things that are going to, to uh, ultimately uh, free us. Um, so those are my two responses and I would love to have a longer conversation about it. Um, hi, my name is Stephanie. Um, I'm with BLM Cambridge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, just to go back to what you were just saying actually, Patrice, my question is, um, what are the trends nationally and internationally around making protests illegal? Wait, could you repeat that? What are the trends nationally and internationally around making protests? Trends. Okay. Yes. Uh, so I know that there was uh, recently, uh, a conference about this in, in Europe in December, uh, what, we've, what the trend internationally, and I'm not sure how, how new it is as much as it is, um, you know, the past decade or so, you've seen the use of uh, tear gas canisters um, around the country from uh, Kenya recently um, to Brazil. A lot of this uh, response uh, comes out of the, the anti-globalization protest and then the, the protests against the Iraq war in 2003, which um, were global. And uh, in the aftermath of that, and of course, also with September 11 as the background, uh, police departments started to have uh, these uh, field trips, is what I would call it, where they would go around to different uh, places in the world and trade tactics on how to fight against uh, movements. And so, for example, our, our own uh, police chief in St. Louis County, Tim Fitch, was in Israel where he received training from the Israel Defense Forces and how to uh, use uh, counterterrorism tactics. And, uh, you know, so that's just an example of some of these transnational connections already happening, but happening. On the, on the state level and happening on the level of how to repress movements. So again, as you were saying earlier, we're playing catch up because the, the exchanges in tactics and equipment um, and training have already been happening for many decades. So they're not, they're not new trends. I think one thing that you're seeing is um, the, the transferal of some of these the, the energy from the, so the Black Lives Matters movement, for example. I know they have a chapter in Ghana, they have chapters um, all around the country. And so states are, are looking to the responses here in the United States and mimicking those. And so uh, it just goes to show that the stakes are so high, right? So if we're able to, to win here, you know, we're hoping that our allies will win abroad. Um, but in lieu of that, you know, we see that the losses here can also translate abroad. Wanted to add a thought there too, in terms of the national trends. I mean, I think we're talking a lot about militarization and we're talking about the sort of the worst possible ways, but to go to your question and the question before then, there are a lot of ways in the United States, um, national trends um, that have been going on for trends that are talking like 100 years that make the use of public space or protest really difficult. And one of them is a, a concept of permits, which is actually quite rare um, in, in the world. In the United States, the idea that you have to ask permission to protest is something that is pervasive in the United States and is not actually, it's something a 19th century construct and is not actually common in other places. 
And the other thing is the commercialization of space. So as these city, a lot of cities, and, and actually a lot of <coughs> cities in the United States look to Boston to how they handle the Occupy protests and how they handle other protests. Um, this, you know, the, free, the first free speech zone in the country, I think, was originated in Boston in response to the Democratic National Convention. So this idea that cities have to be used to attract large conventions and really bring, be a source of revenue and income have also, has also excluded um, they basically privatize space in a way that makes it difficult for movements to use. And I, the third piece I would add is <clears throat> just the, the criminalization of poverty. Um, so a lot of laws against loitering, against um, a lot of different criminal laws that are used to exclude um, unwanted populations from spaces are also being exercised and make it difficult for people to take to the streets, even when they're not being bashed on the head or being tear gassed or have rubber bullets shot at them. I think I'll just add another thing. I think there's a lot of also really interesting examples, um, specifically when we look at the criminalization of protest, of like it's not necessarily that protest is becoming more illegal, um, but police and politicians are operationalizing some of the same existing frameworks. So someone was telling me recently um, that the same it's the same like statute that the government uses to justify um, torturing people under under the guise of investigating terror um, as was used to um, to torture native people when this land was first being settled uh, or like when it was first being settled moving westward um, and just thinking about in Chicago you know we had this new iteration in the late 90s of these gang gang loitering ordinances which made it illegal if a police officer said so to be standing outside in a group of more than one um, and who right and who was being affected by those laws it was young black and brown people in, in the city um, and and thinking about that as in this new iteration of like the slave codes which is where right. the, our police get their whole you know model of policing black Black, pe black people, former slaves in space. Um, and yeah, so just thinking about how these existing frameworks get um, put into practice in these like kind of new formulations to control people. Um, can I just add one thing about the Brazil trajectory as well? Um, one thing that you see in terms of the criminalization of protest is I, I think uh, five different phases in terms of what happened in Brazil in the Confederations Cup and then with the mass protests and, and kind of where things are at now. First is a, a period of surprise where the protest actually has room to create uh, political uh, demands that don't, aren't countered uh, very effectively in media or otherwise by the state. So, so that initial moment happened in Brazil and was very powerful, but it's very short-lived and I think that the progress of repression of those protests, at least in Brazil, went more or less like this force, including show of force, not only the direct um, aggression of protesters, but use of tanks and uh, a RoboCop type equipment and all of this other stuff that can intimidate people off of the streets, uh, followed by prosecution of, of people for minor crimes using some of these statutes, um, the targeting of leadership in particular as maybe the next phase and, and pinning on people long-standing issues that then um, starts to chill those around them even if the leaders uh, stay strong in, in what they're doing. Um, and finally, the hardening of laws where you get into very specific things like uh, his Hisifi proposes a ban on masks which protesters are using because police are filming them and using tear gas against them. Um, and now that's going to be, uh, that's going to occasion trouble for, for people in all sorts of ways like New York uh, proposing of creating, resisting arrest, uh, uh, making it a felony and, and what that might mean, um, certain forms of resisting arrest, and throughout a kind of co slow co-optation of, of protesters into debates about uh, technocratic things or, or just um, mm. other gives. Uh, just to add one last thing. <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk about two different trends that I recognized. Um, in Palestine, uh, the folks there who are protesting, 
I think like here in the States, we, you know, we shut down 195 in Miami uh, or we you know, go to uh, the courthouse or something and folks are arrested. We know that we have Mina here on our team and we're out in a couple hours. Um, a young lady in Palestine um, back in December 2014, it was assumed that she was at a protest, right? And she was like dragged off um, and she's facing six months. In Palestine, if you are at a protest and it said that you're like throwing a rock, um, you, you can have up to 20 year sentence. I don't think that that's like happening to that extent here. We're being, of course, like criminalized outside, we're being tear gassed, we're, you know, being beat up. But I think from what I'm seeing abroad, we're not being incarcerated the way that folks who are protesting abroad are being incarcerated. So I think that that's a space where we have to kind of like step up because we know right. that in a couple hours we'll be out, right? Um, and another thing that I thought was really interesting was having this conver conversation around nonviolence. Um, here in the States, we have to be like, listen, this is a nonviolent movement, okay? This is a, this is a nonviolent movement. Um, and when kind of having conversation with folks in Palestine, it was like, why do you have to say that? Resistance is resistance, and my life is my life, and if it's being threatened, then it's my duty to try to survive. Um, so those were two things that I saw that were really interesting, um, and like a kind of a contrast. Let me just add one word. As you can see, this deserves its own panel discussion. Um, <laughs> it's a big topic, and I do agree with the previous speaker uh, that um, I think we have to be careful to distinguish that, I mean, there are challenges to to the criminalization of protesting here, but it's a completely different ball game in many other countries, Palestine being, of course, among the worst. But if you look at the so-called other democracies, whether it's Brazil or India and so on, I mean, the insidious thing is that it's not an explicit, what one sees is a trend where it's not simply the introduction of new laws that simply say, okay, you should not gather in these places. And although there are such laws that are being increasingly introduced. In India, for example, there is a recent, there is a new city that is being built. And uh, because there is so much public protest about it, um, the government has basically banned any kind of protest and any gathering of more than five people in the entire area. But um, what's more insidious is that governments are increasingly using tax laws and they're using uh, foreign currency transactions to actually put pressure on the most organized groups that provide, for example, important resources for social, mo social movements on the ground. And they do it by forcing them to you know, account for things and using tax and other laws to harass them on a day-to-day -day basis. I was in Hungary last uh, summer, and uh, the civil rights movement that the leading one uh, was uh, supposed to meet with me, and we had this meeting. It got canceled at the last minute because they had just received a notification from the tax department that as of the following week, they were gonna be basically audited and shut down. And they had to go to the court to file a petition to try to you know, find a remedy. So this is an ongoing struggle on a day-to-day -day basis. And my sense is that it's become a lot worse in recent years. We're a little bit over time at the moment, but in the interest of continuing a conversation, which is so fascinating at the moment. We'll take a couple more questions before wrapping up at two, if that's okay with everyone, but feel free yes, to- Yes, I wanted to, to, I wanted to get back to a couple of things that were said. One about the kinds of movements that are out there and a kind of a lament that a lot of the Black Panther movement, communist or whatever, have been decimated. Well, brothers and sisters, let me tell you, I'm Maria from Revolution Books in Cambridge, and I support the Revolutionary Communist Party, and we are here, and we are fighting for revolution, and we want to fight with you to stop the police murders and mass incarceration of people here in this country, and the genocide that's a slow genocide that's moving to a fast genocide. So we are not gone, we're here, and we want you to look at this flyer that you have, because we, want to have a mass movement on April 14th to shut it down, to be in the streets, to bring it back and revive what the gentleman was saying over there, the importance of mass resistance. And I think part of the reason why the mass resistance movement has not been sustained is that people don't fully understand one of the reasons the 
a power of the resistance in the belly of the beast. We are in the country that incarcerates more people here than any place else in the world. We are in the country where the US policies is devastating people all over Latin America in their drone attacks. And patriarchy is the reason that, pe that women in this country are raped and brutalized. We are in the belly of the beast and when people stand up, the beauty that you saw in Ferguson, the people at the bottom who are oppressed and brutalized, when they stand up, people wake up. When they stand up, people here and all over the world stand in solidarity. When we stand up in this country to fight against police murders and mass incarceration, which everyone here needs to do April 14th, people will wake up and that is where the masses can affect change. You can go and talk in front of the UN and use the, the, the structures of power, but those bourgeois structures are also a part and parcel of the ongoing brutality. So I want to bring back into this conversation the power of mass resistance in the belly of the beast and how that is connected to global international movements because here in this country it is predominantly these policies that are so militarizing and brutalizing and murdering people here and all around the world. We want the students to join us April 14th what do you think? Will you do it? <laughs> Can I just request that people ask questions, please? Hello, thank you all very much for your presentations. I'm Nancy Murray, and for 25 years, I worked on issues of racism and surveillance with the ACLU. And I'm wondering how much is understood, do you think, by the public about the surveillance system that's going on um, and its connections with Israel, which are very deep, um, the training system which is going on with the police being sent to Israel for training, including our police right here in Cambridge. The fact that uh, we have racial profiling as a system of, uh, it's called behavioral profiling at Logan Airport, which is brought over from Israel. I mean, my sense is once all of this is really understood, we will be able to develop a real upsurge of activism based on these international connections because we are being so affected by all these systems. So, you know, I guess my overall question, something that's really concerned me is with the kind of databases that are being formed for surveillance purposes, has there been any thinking about what people on the street can do to really thwart ending up in these databases and, uh, you know, having their whole uh, future perhaps, um, you know, harmed by taking that kind of action. I th my own sense is we have to get more and more people out there because that will be a way of pushing back against their ability to criminalize just the few. But if you could talk about that, you know, things like the stingray, which takes up you know, cell phone conversations, the gang databases, which are shared with these you know, all of these uh, fusion centers around the country. How much understanding is there of these things? Right, yeah, I, I, I don't think there's much understanding about it. I, I know that um, in, in my case, um, I've uh, had surveillance done on me um, there's a particular situation during a protest where um, I, I, I was, I was um, already, I already had a, an inclination to believe that there was surveillance happening, and so I sent out a message saying, everybody meet me at Macy's, we're going to protest. And this was during the um, so-called state of emergency, which you know, I, I believe there's always a state of emergency in the United States, but in this particular time, they had tanks on the street in Ferguson, and so I said, everybody, everybody meet me at the Macy's at the Galleria Mall, and in about five minutes, there was a tank 
outside of the Macy's <laughs> Gallery and Mall. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's real, you know, there, I mean, there are, there are attempts to try to block it. There's apps like Virtue out there that try to, try to block it. There are, um, you know, t technological uh, interventions, uh, Glenn Greenwald, Glenwald from the, the, um, the, I think he was in the ACLU for many years, I believe, but he's, he's talked about the importance of privacy in the aftermath of the NSA wiretap scandal. So there, there are a lot of uh, discussions about the issue. What can we do about it? I don't have an answer. If you have an answer, please let, let me know. Um, but I, I think that one of the things that is very poisonous is that it, it's another tactic to, to decimate the trust in movements. Uh, because once the, the issue of security becomes a operational mandate, uh, the trust breaks down. We saw that happen in the Panther Party. And even when the surveillance is not taking place, it's still doing its work. Um, I guess I'll argue a little bit differently, which is I think um, when we t talk about the public, it depends on who we're talking about. I think black people are very clear that we're being surveilled. We've been surveilled since the moment we were brought here. Um, and I say that because parole and probation are one of the biggest surveillance operations in this country, and many of us are on parole or probation. So I just, I, uh, this is a pushback I have with a lot of folks who um, are really interested in the sort of privacy and um, this conversation around surveillance, um, that in a lot of ways I think uh, turns into a, a conversation around uh, middle America and do they know they're being surveilled? Um, and I actually think we should broaden the conversation and talk about how surveillance operates at every sort of um, uh, at every apparatus inside this government, specifically with poor people and black people in particular. I was just going to add one more thing. I think um, uh, you know something that we've been seeing too is um, people who've been uh, standing up and leading uh, the movements in the various uh, cities around the the country have have been targeted in ways, and in a way, you know, because. Um, people have uh, internalized that security and uh, has, has so eroded and, um, and that uh, surveillance is so prevalent that um, there's no way to sort of organize or you know, to structure things differently so that people are less targeted or to protect one another. And so, you know, I mean, I think, I think um, a first step would be at least to start um, documenting or chronicling the kinds of harassment that activists and people who I'd call human rights defenders are um, are being targeted in different places because I think you know for people who you know this this is their lives I mean you know being followed by the police or having their cars broken into every so often those kinds of things they become like just you know they it seems normal but uh, and so folks are not actually I don't know that there is being there is like an effort to like really start to um, document what is happening to different people so that you know patterns can be uh, identified across the country about you know to, for us to understand where it is that the state might be moving in terms of the um, its organization to repress um, activism and repress movements so I think I mean it's just something that needs to be done we need to finish up now, um, but I just want to flag the Human Rights Clinic here at Harvard is thinking about continuing and deepening these conversations, so to please be involved in that. I want to thank you all for coming along, and most importantly, to ask you all to thank our fabulous panellists for sharing all their insights.